Welcome to the other side. I'm your host, Joe Thatcher. Tonight's offering actually comes from a suggestion from a listener, the history of creepy dolls. What is it about dolls that make people so afraid? I think dolls go along the same line as clowns. You know, you see a smiling face, but what's behind that smile, behind that face painter? Even that mask, what's behind those eyes that we can't see, but we know it's there, we feel it deep inside. Let's take a little stroll over to Pollock's Toy Museum. It's one of London's loveliest small museums. You know, it has wooden floors, low ceilings, threadbare carpets, and steep winding stairs housed in two connected townhouses. You know, it's small rooms. House a large, haphazard collection of antique and wood, plastic, lead, paint, chip, toys even. Ugh. And faintly dangerous-looking rocking horses. Stuffed teddy bears from the early 20th century who've seen better days and purportedly a 4,000-year-old mouse fashioned from my Nile clay from ancient Egypt, even. But one thing most people report about this museum, due to those low ceilings, you feel a bit claustrophobic at times in some of those dark corners, especially when you get to the doll room. Oh, There's an entire room just for the dolls. You know, dolls with sleepy eyes and with those staring glass eyes. You know, that type of eyes that seem to follow you across the room and back. You know, you can feel eyes on you in that room is what most people report. You know, some of those old vintage and historical porcelain face dolls over time that white porcelain tends to turn grayish in color like the pale skin of a cadaver you know there's even some rare dolls 150 years old that has wax faces and I think over the decades and that 150 years during the hot summer months Some of that wax gets a little bit looser and During the winter, when the sun goes down early and the rooms are just a little bit darker, a little more shadows and just a little more creepy feel to it. And you feel the coldness in rooms 
the temperature drops when you get to the doll room. You know, they act as though they've gone through a haunted house. I know it's not a great way to end their visit to the Pollock Toy Museum, he says laughing, but anything else that would have seen before the doll room would have been charming and wonderful and cute and perhaps makes one remember back when they were a child. You know, Fira's dolls is a type of pediophobia classified under the broader fear of kind of small humanoid figures and the fear of puppets. But most of the people made uncomfortable by the doll room at Pollock's Toy Museum probably don't suffer from pediophobia so much as an easy to laugh off, often culturally reinforced unease when it comes to dolls and puppets and clowns. You know, I think most people just dismiss them. Oh, I'm scared of dolls, almost humorously. I can't look at those, I hate them. As they laugh jokingly. Most people come down laughing and saying, I am sure hated that last room. That was terrible, Boyd says. Dows, and it must be said, not all dows don't really frighten people so much as they just creep them out. And that is a different emotional state altogether. You know, I think some people, they've had experiences with dows, perhaps as a child, perhaps their whole lives, or perhaps when they became adults. You know, some people in this museum, alone in that back room with the dolls, could swear they hear a tiny laughter or tiny feet walking about in the dark shadows you can't quite see into. The one thing that's usually the same When those things happen, people run from the doll room with white faces, some crying, some needing to be helped out by their husband or boyfriend. You know, I think there is quite a tradition of using dolls to reflect cultural values and how we see children or who we wish them to be says Patricia Hogan. She's a curator at the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. You know, she says, by the end of the 19th century, many parents no longer saw their children as unfinished adults, but rather regarded childhood as a time of innocence that ought to be protected at all costs. In turn, Dow's faces took on a more angelic look. Dolls also have an instructional function, often reinforcing gender norms and social behaviors. Through the 18th and 19th century, dressing up dolls gave little girls the opportunity to learn to sew or to knit. Hogan says girls used to act out social interactions with their dolls. Not only the classic tea parties, but also more complicated social rituals, such as funeral. You know, in the early 20th century, right around the time that women were increasingly leaving the home and entering the workplace, infant dolls became more popular, inducting young girls into the cult of maternal domestic servitude. In the second half of the 20th century, Barbie and her hybrid careers options provided girls with alternative aspirations for their future. While action figures offered boys a socially acceptable way to play with dolls, the recent glut of boy crazy, bizarre proportioned, hyper girl dolls, for instance, like Bratz or Monster High, says something about how society sees girls and even how girls see themselves. Although, 
that is for another discussion. But DAOs, without meaning to, mean a lot. But one of the more relatively recent ways we relate to DAOs is as strange objects. And this is a total scientific term of creepiness in itself. Research into why we think things are creepy and what makes things not creepy and what potential use that might have is somewhat limited, but it does exist. Creepy is a modern sense of the word, has been around since the middle of the 19th century. Its first appearance in the New York Times was in 1877, reference to a story about a ghost. In 2013, Frank McAndrew, a psychologist at Knox College in Illinois, put out a small paper on the working of the hypothesis about what is creepiness and what it means. The paper was based on the results of a survey of more than 1,300 people investigating what creeped them out. Collecting dolls was named as one of the creepiest hobbies. Creepiness, McAndrew says, comes down to uncertainty. You're getting mixed messages. If something is clearly frightening, you scream, you run away. Your heart beats faster. If something is disgusting, you know how to act. But if something is creepy, it might be dangerous, but you're not sure if it is or not. If someone is acting outside of accepted social norms, standing too close or staring, we become suspicious of their intentions. But in the absence of real evidence of a threat, we wait. And in the meantime, call them creepy. The upshot, McAndrew says, is that being in a state of creeped out makes you hypervigilant. It really focuses your attention and helps you process any relevant information to help you decide whether there is something to be afraid of or not. I really think creepiness is where we respond in situations where we just don't know. We don't have enough information to respond, but we have enough to put us on guard to make us aware. You know, dolls themselves inhabit this area of uncertainty largely because they look human, but we know they are not. Our brains are designed to read faces for important information about intentions, emotions, and potential threats. Indeed, we're so primed to see faces and respond to them that We see them everywhere, in streaked windows and toast and banana peels, a phenomenon under the catch-all term, paraphodia. Not a threat, seeing a face that looks human but isn't, unsettles our most basic human instincts. Now, logical thinking would say, "Ah, There's nothing to be afraid of a little piece of plastic. However, says McAndrew, it's sending out social signals. Noting, too, that depending on the dial, these signals could just as easily trigger a positive response such as protectiveness. They look like people, but they aren't people, so we don't know how to respond to it. Just like we don't know how to respond when we don't know whether there is a danger or not. The world in which we are involved in and how we process information, there really weren't things like dolls. You know, some researchers also believe that a level of nonverbal cues such as dolls that make hand movements or their eyes move or they talk, you know, was put in place to fundamentally mimic a human. 
but in a way it just makes him all the more creepy. You know, too much or too little and we get creeped out. You know, the same thing with a doll that just sits there staring at you with no expression on its face, perhaps are the most terrifying because you wonder what is behind those eyes? What is it thinking? What is it going to do to me? You know, before this offering is over tonight, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about some supposed haunted dolls that takes it one more level. Is there some evil force possess that doll? Is it the ghost of the little girl who owned the doll when she was alive? There's a reported haunted doll called Robert the Doll. You know, Robert was an inspiration for the terrifying Chucky doll of child's play. Many people do not know that. But Robert is a life-size doll, which is rather unusual in itself. It was reportedly made by the famous Steph Toy Company in Germany. It was given to the Florida artist Robert Eugene Jean. You know, Otto, as a birthday present when he was a child in 1904, his grandfather had bought it while on a trip to Germany. The doll bears a sailor suit, which was probably a childhood outfit of the real Jean. Another story has it that the doll was a gift from a malicious voodoo practicing maid as revenge for some unknown wrongdoing by the family. Stories of the doll's odd behavior began early with reports of the doll changing expressions and even moving around the house on its own. Reports of hearing tiny footsteps, sounds of what sounded like a small child laughing in the other room. You know, one theory says that Gene himself unleashed the doll's powers by blaming his childhood misdeeds on the life-size doll who wore his clothes and had his name. Those who lived in the house reported hearing Jean talking to Robert. But what was more unsettling was sometimes you could hear someone talking to Jean. As the years went on, Robert's deeds turned darker. The doll was blamed for many misfortunes, including financial collapse, broken bones, and even car accidents. Robert remained in the Otto family home in Key West, Florida, throughout Gene's life and even after his death. The house passed to new owners who kept the living doll for 20 years. Robert now resides in a museum in Key West where now only brave tourists can visit him. You know, the next now, probably uh, a lot of our own children or grandchildren or perhaps ourselves have had the Elmo doll. You know, that furry red Elmo doll was one of the most successful toys ever sold. Talking Elmo dolls have been a must-have holiday gift since the first one was sold in 1996. Early Elmos giggled when they were tickled. They acquired, acquired larger vocabularies as the years went by and the technology got better. However, that doesn't explain the Elmo knows your name. A doll purchased by the Bowman family in 2008 for their two-year-old son, James. Elmo Knows Your Name was programmed to speak its owner's name along with a few other phrases. 
But when the Bowmans changed Elmo's battery, the nightmare began. The Dow started ablibbing in a sing-songy voice. The Dow began to chant, Kill James, kill James, kill James. Not really something any parent is likely to find endearing in a toy. We next go to Mandy the Haunted Doll. Mandy does not play well with others. In the Quesnel Museum in Canada, where she now lives, staff say they must keep her in a separate display case. When she is displayed with other dolls, she knocks them over. Staff also report their lunches disappear and that visitors' cameras often fail and their batteries die suddenly while taking pictures of Mandy. You see, Mandy is a porcelain baby doll, probably manufactured in Europe around 1910. The woman who donated her reportedly told the museum she was getting rid of the doll because it began to cry in the night from the other room. When the doll was examined, the doll was hollow. There was no mechanism to make it make any sound at all. So she gladly gave it away to the museum. There have been reports of the night security patrol at the museum of hearing that cry in the night. The next story is a haunted gang. Most haunted dolls are dumped by their owners when they start behaving badly. But the owners of these eight dolls were reportedly interested in paranormal phenomenon and bought this collection because they were told it was haunted. Their names, Crystal, Monica, Sharla, True, Isaac, Lily, Cameron, and Ashley. The owners have a camera constantly recording the dolls and other parts of the house. In 2009, one camera appears to have recorded something strange. A ghostly boy began appearing at the bottom of the staircase and in different parts of the house. He would stare at the living souls who could catch him, sending shivers down their spines. Our next doll is Ruby, the haunted doll. Like a few of the dolls on this list, Ruby could never stay in one place at a time. Its owners often found the doll in different rooms of the house where more If you picked up Ruby, it induced feelings of sadness and and nausea, forcing those who picked it up to put it down quickly. According to its former owners, Ruby was passed down from generation to generation in the family. The doll's spooky origins traces back many, many years ago to a young family relative who was said to have passed away while clutching the figure. After jumping between different families members, Ruby has now found her forever home at the Traveling Museum of the Paranormal and the Occult, where visitors often feel an overwhelming dread and sorrow when they are in front of the doll. Charlie the Haunted Doll. Charlie was first discovered in the attic of an old Victorian house in upstate New York in 1968. Charlie was locked away inside a trunk with newspapers dating back to the 1930s. 
and a yellow piece of paper that had the Lord's Prayer written on it. The family placed a figure on display with their other dolls and toys. Soon, however, Charlie seemed to move on its own, swapping places with the other toys. Not long thereafter, the family's youngest daughter claimed that Charlie spoke to her in the middle of the night. The parents dismissed the claim, chalking it up to their daughter's overactive imagination. But the little girl and her siblings were terrified of Charlie. They refused to go near it when mysterious scratches appeared on the little girl's body. The family decided to look Charlie back up. They found no information, but they took it back to the attic. And they attached that Lord's Prayer to the doll and locked it back in the trunk. Charlie now resides at a local museum in Massachusetts, which also seconds as an oddity shop, just minutes away from Salem, Mass. I guess in the end, a fitting final home for the doll. I hope you have enjoyed tonight's offering and thank you to the listener for this great subject for the show. Until next time.